Hello and welcome to the week one roundup for the Jane Austen MOOC. Uh, my name is Alistair Dawson and I'm here with my colleague Alison Daniel. And uh, we've been some fascinating discussions on the boards this week. We're so glad that uh, you're all enjoying yourselves uh, and we're going to dive straight in. Yeah, we are. Um, we're going to be concentrating on three different topics this week. We're going to be looking at the Austin versus Bronte discussion, which is really taking off. We're going to be looking at education, which is Alistair's specialist area. And then we're going to be talking a little bit about reading because that has prompted quite a lot of discussion on the notice boards. Um, but to start off, one of the things which has been really quite thought provoking on the boards has been the idea of passion in novels as opposed to control and a lot of people have been talking about how Austen is a more controlled writer whereas Bronte perhaps because of the influence of the sort of wider romantic culture yeah. is interested in passion in emotion in big landscapes whereas Austen tends to focus on um, she sort of has a smaller not a smaller palette, but perhaps a, a smaller, smaller panorama that she wishes wishes to draw. Um, and obviously, the big contrast in Austen's novels between passion and between control. The most famous book where this is happening is Sense and Sensibility, where Marianne embodies the idea of passion and spontaneity and emotion, whereas Eleanor is much more controlled, her feelings perhaps are a little bit repressed, she tries to deny how she's feeling about Edward. And Really, the discussion on the on the boards has been, is Austin on one side or the other? Is Austin pro-control or is Austin interested in a little bit of passion as well? And um, I think that the conclusion that's being reached is that certainly within Sense and Sensibility, what Austin is saying is that, yes, too much passion is not a good thing, but equally too much control is not good either. And I'm sure that everybody remembers the scene right at the end of the novel where Edward says to Eleanor that he is free and he wants to marry her. And Eleanor's response is to cry um, because she has all that pent up emotion. And I think Austin's point really is that neither extreme is particularly healthy. As with most things in the 18th century, it is neither too much of one thing nor too much of the other. You must stay on this absolutely minute line right down the middle uh, and that's that's kind of the proper path to take and, and this kind of thing speaks to some of the the things that we were talking about about education as well in uh, in the 18th century this idea of control of self-control um, and what an education is actually supposed to be um, and we thought we might talk a little bit um, today about about what actually an 18th century education was um, and, and what purposes it served. Um, we talked a bit on, on the boards um, and one of the, the, the biggest things that I want to pick up on is this uh, kind of conflict, if you like, between who's giving the education to uh, young people and especially to young girls. Um, and there was a wonderful, I think it's uh, Anne Selnick pointed this out about Pride and Prejudice. Um, Lady Catherine de Burr talking um, about education uh, and she's shocked that no governess was involved. She says, your mother must have been quite a slave to your education. And there's this wonderful idea about who is giving this in the education to girls. Is it mothers, is it governesses, or is it self-education? And I think Austin has many things to say on that front. Um, whether that's about Catherine de Burr, who as we've seen through the message boards, has particular views that Austin is perhaps parodying, doesn't Lady particularly... Lady Catherine de Burr has particular views about a number of Indeed, things. indeed. Yeah. Um, but this idea of what, who was doing the education and was it governesses was, was a huge part of, of a great many debates in the 18th century um, that Austin was part of. Um, mothers were supposed to be significantly involved in their um, children's education. Um, that had gone quite far back. Indeed, Rousseau was one of the big men to have weighed in on that issue. Um, but it's different for women and it's different for boys. Um, this idea that women should be perhaps under their mother's tuition for a bit longer. Um, boys would very quickly grow out of that kind of maternal educational period um, and would become, well, they'd be trained towards their vocation, um, which can mean a great many things in the 18th century. Um, men had a much 
bigger variety of things that they could actually do. But there were aspects of women's education that we perhaps wouldn't necessarily today think of as being necessarily female and one of those is that women were expected to be able to do bookkeeping and run accounts which isn't Absolutely. something which today we think of as being specifically female. Absolutely, so. we, we, we tend to focus when we're thinking about 18th century education on things like the needlework and the manners and the Music. singing exactly yes. but actually a great many women in fact most women would have had things like arithmetic in their education to allow them to do the books for their household if this was a, a particularly aristocratic woman then that bookkeeping would not have been done necessarily by her directly she would probably have had a housekeeper to do it but she would have been involved in running the accounts for the house and for those of a slightly more middling income but still being educated we're still talking about you know a tiny percentage at the top of society here and those women would have done the books themselves they would have been in charge of paying all of the members of the household on time they would have kept strict accounts because money was an issue even though these men, these women might have had money it had to be kept under strict control uh, they didn't necessarily do the accounts for everything um, but they would have done the vast majority of them and i think that's a very interesting point amanda vickery has written a book called the gentleman's daughter which of course fans of jane austen will see that that title is reminiscent of, uh, of a particular line in Pride and Prejudice. Um, and one of the things that Vickery has talked about is this role of female bookkeeping as being part of the essential skills that you needed in order to run a house. And her research has indicated that women would run, if you like, the domestic accounts related to the house, whereas their husbands would run a separate account book that was related to outdoor activities. So things like looking after horses or running the carriage or shooting or that sort of thing. That would be a separate book which was kept by the husband. So both sexes needed to do it, but it was predominantly the domestic accounts which fell to the lot of women and women had to be, had to be good at it. Absolutely. And this brings us to one of the other things that we were talking about with education this week, which was that kind of juxtaposition between Mary Wollstonecraft and Hannah More. And in that sense, Hannah More's kind of idea of educating women for their duty as a wife and mother very much is involved in that idea of Yes, they must be able to be good at bookkeeping, they must be able to run a household. That was absolutely part of female education. Whereas for Wollstonecraft, there's absolutely an argument that needs to be uh, an expansion of female opportunity, an expansion of women's minds, and, and the kinds of things that they were um, able to, to access. Um, yes, um, the, the, worst, the worst outcome for Wollstonecraft of a female education is the Lady Bertram figure who sits on a sofa with some lap dogs and really has no energy to do anything at all. That's, that's the kind of bete noir yes. for Wollstonecraft. And there's, there's, I think there's a wonderful quote in Wollstonecraft um, that says that in day-to-day -day life, you know, education for a woman is, is absolutely essential, uh, but in a destitute position, it would be her only consolation. Um, and that is kind of, that sums up her views on, on, on female education wonderfully um, and, and how important it was to, the, yeah. to these women um, who had, they had many things to do in their day-to-day -day lives. That's the other kind of thing that we often get wrong. These women were not sitting around doing nothing all day by any means, um, but they did have leisure time uh, and they did spend a great deal of it reading. Yes, um, and of course this is one of the big topics that we've been looking at this week. And reading in Jane Austen's novels really um, has three different areas associated with it. We've got performative reading, so what are people signalling when they're reading? What social signals are they sending out? What type of book are they reading and what does that say about them as a character? And also there's a very interesting discussion developing um, on how reading signified socioeconomic class um, and also indeed what you read might not just signify your class but it might inform your reading because if you were of a lower socioeconomic class you probably wouldn't be able to afford to access things like novels through the circulating libraries which cost money to join so there's no such thing as a free public library no. in Austin's world um, and novels themselves were actually very expensive commodities and cost an awful lot of money so unless you were very wealthy you weren't going to be buying your own books and there was a whole 
strata of society who could not afford even to access these things through libraries. Absolutely, and, and people like Austin and many of her characters are reliant on male relatives to access their reading. Um, it's really interesting from, the, from a material culture point of view that absolutely, as you say, these books were really expensive commodities to the extent that um, books were often bought just as the sheets of paper themselves and then they were bound by the particular families in their particular style, which is why you get these beautiful libraries which are all uniform that we simply don't get in the same way today. Um, but that speaks to a question about, as you were saying, what are people reading? What are people reading and why do they have books is the, is the other yeah. thing. Now, Sharon Dolan made a really interesting point where she talked about a library as being a fashion commodity. Mm. and. If you walked into a library in a great house, you wouldn't necessarily expect all of those books to be read, which to us is, is completely counterintuitive. Why would you have a library and then not read the books? But it's because they're not necessarily there as repositories of knowledge or indeed devices to entertain you. The books are there to look good in the same way that you would want your daughters to be able to speak Italian and play the harp, you would want your library to have a spread of books which represented your learning and cultured approach to the world. Absolutely, demonstrating that you had good taste in reading. Yes. Taste was so important and having good taste was something that people worked very hard to, to, to develop. Yes. Um, so yes, these, this idea that books were there to be seen. To be seen and I'm sure that Alistair, I sent Alistair has too, but I've certainly come across um, examples of researchers who've gone into um, look at the collections of big libraries and they are the first people to look at those books. They have to yeah. slip the pages to in order to read the book because yes. nobody else, nobody has opened this book since it Absolutely. was printed, which is quite extraordinary. The final point of reading, which I think is really, really interesting and was made by Medina Campbell on the message boards very recently, was the idea as well as reading reflecting your personality. So that's why Catherine Morland reads Gothic novels is because that's the sort of person she is. As well as that aspect to reading in Austin, um, reading can also affect your psychological state. So for example, in um, Persuasion, um, Captain Benwick, I'm never sure if it's Benwick or Benwick, I'm sure somebody will let me know. Um, Captain Benwick is um, very unhappy, he's very melancholy and he's reading a lot of poetry. And Anne Elliot actually gives him a reading list and she says, don't read that, read this, with the idea that his mood, his psychological outlook was going to be affected by his reading matter. And that's a very astute and very subtle way in which Austin is using reading and reading material to talk about how mental health was discussed and seen in the period. And I think it's probably quite likely that she's taken that from a common practice in the period, which was women corresponding with one another about things that they had read. Uh, and they did recommend books to each other, and they did give opinions on those books. Um, and, and there is this sense of community that surrounds that, um, yeah. that, that perhaps is, is, is reflected in, in Austen's fiction there. Yes. Well, we hope you've enjoyed the roundup. And we're looking forward to engaging with you over the next few weeks. Absolutely. And um, next week is particularly interesting from my point of view because we're going to be looking at money and economics. And we've also got some lovely close reading exercises to do on Mansfield Park as we look at land and landscape. Absolutely. So, uh, well, we'll leave you to next week's reading. Yes, keep, keep reading, um, keep commenting on the message boards and we'll see you soon.